always find it a, a great pleasure to follow a Canadian because I always say to Canadians, you come from the second luckiest country in the world, to which every Canadian always says to me, I suppose you're going to say Australia is the first. And I say, well, yes. And I'll tell you why, and you will agree with me. And we'll test this and see if she agrees. And I say, let's compare Canada and Australia, both big countries, both low population densities, both fantastic cities with very good education systems, very good health systems, very good environments, great forests, great places to go camping, clean water, beautiful mountains and vistas, they're cold, we're hot, that's just a matter of flavour, but we have a continent all by ourselves. <laughs> Every Canadian then goes, yeah, you're right, <laughs> gotcha. So I'm here to talk about exploding the misconception of Belt and Road. Because when you look at the mining industry, when you look at resources, when you look at where this is heading over the next 20, 30, 40 years, if you're not looking at mining, mining finance, mining customers through the lens of the return of China to global dominance and understanding what the Belt Road Initiative is, then you're missing some enormous opportunities and missing potentially some enormous threats. So I'm here to speak through just briefly what the Belt Road is, what some of the misconceptions is, and why it is looking at connecting Africa through Central Asia and South Asia into China, but not really about Europe. And most Europeans, and in that I include the British, find it a very difficult message to accept. So let me set some context. We, as a species, human beings, we are very bad at uh, accepting change. We are not good at seeing what's happening. The 1865 Locomotive Act, by example, used to require a man, and it had to be a man, to walk in front of your car and wave a red flag so it didn't scare the horses. That stayed in current law in some common law jurisdictions until 2008. It obviously wasn't followed, and you probably would have been arrested if you had have followed it, but we can sometimes be very slow at seeing and accepting change. And my culture, and the culture of many people in this room, but not all, the white Anglo-Saxon Christian culture, we are particularly bad at it. By example, we call the years 400 to 1400 the Dark Ages, and we learned in school that we called it the Dark Ages because the world went backwards. But the world didn't go backwards. Only we did. Only our culture did. There was enormous advances in mathematics, science, medicine, but all outside of our culture. Hence, we didn't learn about it. And let me give you an example. What was the Roman numeral for the number zero? Anyone? What was the Roman numeral for the number zero? There wasn't one. And how do you have the number zero, sorry, how do you have our counting system and our money system without the number zero? The truth is, you can't. So whoever invented or perfected the number zero is an incredibly important person in our history. What's his name? And what does it say about our education systems that we don't know the name of the person who invented or perfected the number zero? And it's this guy, Muhammad al Khorazamu who in 795 perfected it in his mathematical uh, university outside Kiva in Uzbekistan. But we don't remember that. We don't recognise that in our history because it happened outside of our culture. Likewise, we learned a lot about Galileo, but this guy, Mirza Ulugbek, not only said the world was round, but measured the length of the year to a more accurate date and a more accurate time than anyone until computers were invented in the year 1200 or thereabouts from his observatory outside Samarkand in Uzbekistan. Now, why did these two things happen in Uzbekistan? And if you think about the Silk Road, that period 400 to 1400 that we called the Dark Ages, actually the Silk Road was booming. And the Silk Road went from sub-Saharan Africa through Central Asia to China. And smack bang in the middle, was Uzbekistan. And that's why so much of this great learning, this great development of knowledge, 
was taking place because it was smack bang in the middle of where trade was happening. The power of trade that created knowledge, that created opportunity, that created threats. But we didn't see that. It didn't happen in our culture and therefore we dismissed it. And in some ways, we are repeating that exact same mistake today. <coughs> because when you talk about China, a lot of people look at graphs like this and they talk about China rising. White Anglo-Saxon Christians, we don't have a very good sense of a long historical narrative. So we look at graphs like this going back to 1980 and say, it's really clear China is rising. But if I turn around and I say, hang on, let me just give a longer historical perspective. Let's take that graph back a little bit further to the birth of Jesus Christ. And then we find for most of the time, up until about the mid-1800s, China and India were the dominant economies around the world. And the Europeans were actually insignificant, and the US hardly existed. And then the Europeans took over in the mid-1800s. The white Anglo-Saxons took over. China and India came down. Western Europe and the United States started to rise. Now, what were the turning points for when China turned down and for when China started rising again? Well, China and India came down as a proportion of the global economy when the Industrial Revolution happened. So what really was the Industrial Revolution? Prior to the Industrial Revolution, individual productivity around the world was more or less the same. The vast majority of people were subsistence farmers with a small trading class and a small ruling class. In other words, there was a direct link between your population size and your economic size. If you had a big population, you had a big economy. If you had a small population, you had a small economy, simple. When the Industrial Revolution hit, we just got lucky that our culture invented the steam engine and the cotton jenny. And that funded things like the age of exploration, etc. But what the Industrial Revolution actually did was not knock out of sync the link between population size and economic size because it gave an enormous boost to individual productivity. You could now have a small population and a big economy like Britain or Belgium or Portugal. And then what happened around about 1950? is we started the information age. And we took all that information about individual productivity and we shared it. We put IT hubs in China, we put call centers in the Philippines, we put factories in India. In other words, we gave all of that knowledge. So what's happening today is not so much China rising, it's not even China returning and to an extent India returning. What's happening today is the world is returning to balance, where there will be a direct link again between your population size and your economic size. Because there's no longer a comparative advantage on knowledge, it's all about the implementation of knowledge. And that explains why China has been growing quite a lot faster than India over the last 20 or 30 years, because China has an administrative and bureaucratic system that allows for faster implementation of knowledge than India has. I only landed back from India last night and I find it enormously frustrating, as many of you here will if you do work in India, how many times you have to show your passport between the taxi and the aeroplane as just one example of the bureaucratic nightmare that is India. I'm very pessimistic about India, I'm very optimistic for China. So what we are actually seeing is the world is returning to balance, where there will be a direct link between your population size and economic size because there's no longer a comparative advantage on knowledge, it's about implementation of knowledge. Now when I say this to particularly American audiences, they say, no, you're wrong because we're going to invent the next big thing. Well actually China has now accelerated the number of patents that they're putting in place and arguably the next psychological challenge, the next break in the link between population size and economic size might very well come from China or India or somewhere completely unpredictable. But until the next industrial revolution scale change happens, the world's returning to balance where your population size and economic size are in link. In other words, it's driven by demographics and it's unstoppable. 
So you can argue about it as much as you like, or you can accept it and then start to ask the question, what does that mean for me, my family, my business? So it's a historical rebalance. <coughs> Through the great changes, we have seen and will see again what I call the agnostic power of trade. But where will that trade be? What will the culture of trade be? So we're having a global rebalancing between economic influence and population size. And we're changing the culture of global trade from what to what? If we say the culture of global trade today is driven by largely the American laissez-faire free enterprise individualistic model, and if we are going more Asian or returning to a more Asian focus, then it's going back to more the collective type of culture of trade as it was for a thousand years. What does that mean for our relations with our customers, our external people, the local communities with which we operate. If we are relying on the culture of corporate governance set in Western countries, but over the next 10, 15, 20 years, that will fundamentally change, are we ready to adapt to that change? So let's talk about Belt Road for a moment. So a lot of people have heard about the Belt Road Initiative now, but most people in Europe, in my experience living here in the UK, I think it's like this top left-hand graph, connecting China with Europe. Because the Europeans have to think it's about them. They can't culturally perceive of a massive change happening in the world if it's not involving Europe. And I'll talk about Brexit in a moment. But if you look at the bottom left, this is actually what the Belt Road Initiative is. There's a lot more coming from China through Central Asia down into Sub-Saharan Africa. Here's a couple of things people don't understand about Sub-Saharan Africa. Five of the seven fastest growing economies in the last 15 years are in Sub-Saharan Africa. If I mention the name of one country to you, I will demonstrate how many of us white Anglo-Saxon Christian cultural people have a perception of Africa that is 20 years out of date. I'll give you the name of a country. I'll ask you to think inside your head, what are the first two words that jump into your mind when I mention this country. You ready? The country is Rwanda. And I bet you most of you are thinking violence, genocide, or something negative. Put your hand up if you're thinking something negative about Rwanda. So let me tell you, the World Economic Forum came out with a report four months ago listing countries from the safest, number one, to least safe, 150. And Rwanda was number nine. Safer than the UK, safer than the United States, not as safe as Australia or Canada. Now, I was working in Rwanda in the mid-1990s, and I can tell you, it was a basket case. I think Donald Trump uses another term beginning with sh and ending in whole. And I went back in Easter this year. It is a phenomenal change. It is a genuinely inspiring story, as are many of the economies in sub-Saharan Africa. The countries that were in war when I first worked in Africa that are not in war now include Namibia, Botswana, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, and a whole series of others. Really, there are only two or three genuine basket cases left in Africa. Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, South Sudan, but most of the others, the actual risk perception is much different from actual risk. Take Somaliland. Everyone perceives Somaliland as as risky as the rest of Somalia, but it's been operating independently for 20 years. The actual risk in Somaliland is very different to the perceived risk. So your operation could be much more effective there than you're currently taking into account. Now, who is getting this risk assessment right in Africa? While we are looking at Africa through lenses that are 20 years out of date, and the answer is the Chinese are. So if we go to this right-hand map. So Belt Road Initiative isn't just the pipelines that's connecting Europe and Britain. It's a whole lot of things going on in Africa. And those of you who are investing or working in Africa will have seen a lot of it. 
the new airport in Lilongwe, the new road from Maputo down to Ponta de Oro and Mozambique, or here, the Chinese have rebuilt the Mombasa to Nairobi train line and are about to build Nairobi into Kisangani. Now, why Kisangani? In Kisangani, a little village in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is a single track, narrow gauge railway that goes from Kisangani to Kinshasa. Once you build the train line from Nairobi to Kisangani, you have connected East and West Africa by rail for the first time ever. Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, now also the president of the African Union, is currently negotiating to create an all Africa passport. And they're experimenting it just with heads of state at the moment. But imagine if you connected ECOWAS with SADAC with the East African bloc under a common all African passport, what intra-Africa trade will look like. And the non-Africans that are understanding this the best are the Chinese. The Europeans love to say China's Belt Road Initiative as it applies to Africa is just the Chinese raping and pillaging Africa like the Europeans raped and pillaged Africa. The Europeans love to say that because it makes them feel a little bit better about the fact that they did rape and pillage Africa. But China's not. China's not putting in colonial governments. Yes, they are putting in loans. Yes, they are tying future contracts for resources. But they're also doing what I call the Henry Ford approach. Henry Ford used to say, I've got to pay my workers well enough and my cars need to be cheap enough that every one of my workers can buy a car. In the same way, China is not just investing and loaning money to create nation building infrastructure. It's creating future markets for its processed goods and creating a guaranteed future supply line. If the African countries and China get this balance right, it is the best opportunity the African continent has had ever for economic growth, if the balance <coughs> is right. But what China is not doing is what the Europeans did to Africa. When the Belgians left the Congo, they took everything of value, including the globes and the street lights and the copper cabling that connected the electricity centers. So when I hear Europeans saying the Chinese investment in Africa is a negative influence, I just think that's guilt from the Europeans for how much bad they did for the African continent. So we've got to re-envisage what we think about Belt Road. It's not connecting China and Europe, it's actually connecting the fastest growing region in the world with the second fastest growing region in the world with the third fastest growing region in the world and our culture is a sideline. And we've got to get that perception right if we're going to understand what our role is in the future. So how will this look? The Belt Road Initiative with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, most people have heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership because Donald Trump got rid of it. To be fair to Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton said she was going to get rid of it too. But then you ask people, so you think it's bad that Donald Trump got rid of TPP? They say yes. I say, okay, what was TPP? And then they look at you blankly because they've read the media and they assume that it was a bad idea to get rid of it because the media says it's bad, because the media don't like Donald Trump, but they don't actually understand what TPP was. Trans-Pacific Partnership was, if I overgeneralize, a free trade and political agreement in the Asia Pacific, led by China, sorry, led by the United States, but excluding China. The great irony of Donald Trump's reason for getting rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because we want to bring our jobs back from China, TPP didn't include China. And when the Americans started to lead the process in TPP, the Chinese responded with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is a China-led free trade and political agreement in the Asia Pacific, but excluding the United States. In a sense, TPP and RCEP were China and the United States way of saying picking sides. And then the Americans got rid of TPP. They gift wrapped the Asia Pacific to the Chinese. Now, a number of Asia-Pacific countries are not quite ready, including Australia, to hand leadership over to the Chinese yet. So hence, they're doing TPP minus the United States as best they can. But even the Singaporean Prime Minister, in a great statement or understatement, has said the United States exit from the TPP has hurt confidence in US policy. It's not just hurt, hurt confidence, it's hurt leadership. Beijing is increasingly positioning itself 
as the lead for global free trade. Now, who would have thought that that was going to happen just five years ago? What's it going to look like in 20? <coughs> and Belt Road Initiative has got to be seen in all of this great, great context that China and India were the dominant economies. The historical norm isn't European, Anglo-Saxon, white, Christian dominance. The norm is Asian dominance. The Anglo-Saxon, white, Christian dominance is the historical spike, not the norm. And it's a historical spike that's coming to an end now because the comparative advantage in knowledge is disappearing. So we're relinking population size and economic size. Are we ready for this change? Belt Road Initiative and uh, RCEP is just two examples of the way we are building around us a cultural dominance by China without even realizing how big it is. In fact, what we're going through right now is a once in a millennial shift in power of global trade. There has not been a shift this big for centuries. I call the period in life that we're living through right now as the sixth great human transition. And the six great human transitions are these. Egyptian to Greek, Greek to Roman, Roman to Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian to Muslim, Muslim to Christian, and now we're going Christian to Chinese. Each of the other transitions took centuries to finish. This one's taking 20 years, and we're already 10 years through it. Each of the other five transitions took place with a major war. Are we able to escape a major war while this transition takes place? But even through all of the wars and conflict that took place in the other five changes, we always had the agnostic power of trade. So, are you a company that is flexible enough to survive both the cultural and political shifts that are taking place? Or are you still digging your heels in to say, no, white people are going to be dominant? You wouldn't phrase it that way, but is that your cultural mindset? Is that what you're actually thinking? Or are you ready to shift? Do you understand the many cultures and communities that you're working in, and are you best placed to work with those communities and cultures, to lower your operational risk, to ensure that financiers and investors can have confidence in your company? Cornerstone Capital, for example, our business model is we believe the financial markets don't price in community risk ratings in net present value calculations properly. In other words, companies with a demonstrably good community relationship have a lower risk of operations, but because the markets don't price that in, they're an undervalued asset. On the other hand, companies with a demonstrably poor community relationship have a higher risk of operations and are an overvalued asset. We invest in the undervalued assets. So we do a very, when we do our due diligence, we do the standard financial DD, we then do a very deep dive on ESG issues, environmental, social and governance, and then we do a particularly deep dive on social. If you don't have a demonstrably good community relationship, and I don't mean corporate social responsibility, which is just fluff, then we won't invest in you. Co companies that link profit, purpose and heart in many ways are best placed to receive our capital but also best placed to evolve and adjust rapidly as we're going through this sixth great human transition. But just to give you even more information about how big this transition is and how little we sometimes know about it, hands up if you've heard of the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. It's one or two hands coming up. Every hand should go up and this is why. Shanghai Cooperation Organization was started about 16 or 17 years ago by China. Initially, China and the Central, Afri Central Asian states, people didn't really care. Russia then joined in, Mongolia joined in. This year, sorry, last year, India and Pakistan both joined. India and Pakistan joined together. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization now has within it around about 50% of the global population and heading towards 50% of the global economy, already close to 50% in PPP terms. It's the new G20. 
massive military exercises that happened on Russia and Chinese border earlier this year were under the auspices of the SCO. Almost now, all the significant non-African Belt Road Initiative countries are members of the SCO. And when we see the G20 meeting, we all get excited about how Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump shake their hands, but we didn't see how President Xi snuck into the back of the room, had a meeting with ECOWAS, had a meeting with SADC, had a meeting with the Non-Aligned Group, had a meeting with the African Union, had a meeting with the BRIC countries, and finalised most of the border disputes between India and China. All while we didn't notice. Why didn't we notice? Is it because we're repeating the same mistakes that we repeated when we called the years 400 to 1400 the Dark Ages? Because this massive change is happening outside of our culture. And if we're not going to wake up, we're not going to maximise the opportunities that come from this, and we're not going to avoid the risks that come from this. So what? What are the great opportunities in this changing world for your business? What are the great threats? Are you ready to maximise those? Are you talking about them? Are you thinking about them? Are you correctly positioned for the turmoil of transition? How is mining impacted in this? Trade routes, transport routes, demand for what product are you mining? The finance, the markets, the FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Have we learned from Stern Hugh and what happened to him? I can talk about that case in, uh, at another time. But are we ready for this? Are we seeing the change? And to give you another example how we're not so good at seeing the change, let me make this comment on Brexit. As an Australian living in Britain, while this country is self-destructing, without them realising it, that gives you my opinion on Brexit, I find it amusing to watch. And I spoke to a pro-Brexit friend of mine, and the Brexit advisory services business we started was between myself and a guy named Donald Blaney, very, very strong Brexit, I remember very strong Remain. We don't agree on anything politically, except we're on the same debate team at the University of Southampton in 1994 and managed to stay mates. And a lot of British people show me maps like this because this is the world map that a lot of Europeans are used to because they put Europe in the middle and the visuals are important. And these Brexit people said to me, look, we're going to be fine because we're smack bang in the middle of the two largest economies. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? We're between China and America. See, he said, showing me the map. So I showed him this map. Where are you now? You put Asia in the middle of the map, like we do in Australia, and suddenly China is here and America is here. Britain's not there in the middle. Britain's way up here. In 1835, probably the most remote part of the world was down here, Melbourne. Well, it was founded in 1835. By 1852, it was the world's richest city by head of population, 97% reliant on mining. Today, it's 7% reliant on mining, and for the last 10 years, nine of them, it's been the world's most livable city. Now it's second. We'll get it back. But... By 2035, will London be as remote to the centre of world power as Melbourne was in 1835? Really interesting question. Because when you go to Uzbekistan, and you go to a town called Merv, actually Turkmenistan, and you go there, in 1200s, Turkmenistan was the largest city in the world. And you can imagine walking in there in the 12th century and going, this city would never die. The historians at the time said it had three million people. This city will never die. And then Kublai Khan came in and sacked it. And if you ever go to Merv, the really interesting thing, it was the last major mud brick city in the world. And after Kublai Khan sacked it, they left. Never been rebuilt, never been cleaned up. You can go there now, and the big mud brick circular wall is now a circular sand dune. The citadel is now a circular sand dune. You can run your fingers through the sand and it's fine grain because it was mud brick and you pick up the vertebra and the fibula of the people that were killed because it's never been cleaned up. But that city thought it was never going to die. Like this city thinks, like New York thinks. People change, cultures change. And we are going through right now the sixth great human transition and it's not about us. But there's the agnostic power of trade, and are we ready to accept that China is not rising, it's returning, that global centres of influence are shifting, but have not yet shifted? 
Are you ready for the turmoil? Are you ready to take advantage of the opportunities and to avoid the threats? Thank you very much.